Hello everyone and a warm welcome back to our Evolution and Ecology seminar series. My name is Elizabeth Duxbury and I'm a postdoc in the research group of Alexei Maklakov at the University of East Anglia. I'll be your host for today's session. Myself and our wonderful team of co-organisers, Andreas Ulia Wouter, in the groups of Judith Mank and Simone Imler at the Universities of British Columbia and of East Anglia, are very grateful for the enthusiasm from the research community for this initiative and are delighted by the fantastic lineup of speakers we have planned for you. So thank you all for your engagement in the excellent set of talks that we have been honoured to host so far. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to remind you all that there will be a Q&A session directly after the talk. So please post your questions in the Questions for Seminars Slack channel and upvote questions you'd like to hear. We aim to keep the whole session to one hour in length. So it is my gr great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Alexander Su, lecturer in evolutionary biology, genetics and genomics in the School of Biological Sciences at the University of East Anglia and research leader in the Department of Organismal Biology at Uppsala University in Sweden. Alex's research explores the evolutionary genomics of repetitive DNA, including transposable elements and viruses, and the consequences of these intriguing genomic parasites for host diversity, genome size evolution, and the sex chromosomes, using a diverse range of bird, reptile, mammal, and even invertebrate systems. Most recently, Alex's work has focused on an additional aspect of so-called genomic dark matter and successfully sequenced for the first time the unusual germline restricted chromosome in the zebra finch. Alex has received several awards recognizing his outstanding contribution to evolutionary biology and even impressively published two science papers in the same year. Today, Alex will present his talk entitled The Evolution of Genomic Oddities making sense of transposons, satellites, and germline soma differences in birds. So thank you, Alex, for accepting our invitation, and over to you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I admit that this talk uh, title is a bit of a longer version that I maybe should have put on the slide. It's hard to fit it in here, but uh, yeah, that's what I'm gonna talk about today. A lot of different aspects of birds, but before I start that, I wanna start, uh, thank all the organizers also for giving this fantastic opportunity to like really speak about some of our recent research in the last four years, approximately, that we have uh, yeah, had this research by basically. And also really like having this opportunity to yeah, make the world a bit of a smaller place right now in these difficult times. So thanks so much for doing this. It's fantastic. And yeah, without further ado, I want to talk about birds. So I think there might be a reason why you're here and listening right now, which is that you appreciate the diversity and color and shape and size and sounds and anything you can think of ecology of birds and for that reason of course we want to understand the genetic basis of what's going on here and why they look so fantastic and different um on the other hand side maybe you're here because you're interested in genome evolution and then you might wonder well i vaguely remember that there's not much going on in bird genomes so maybe that's uh, an intriguing reason of being here today to listen to this talk because i'll try to tell you some rather odd things about bird genome evolution and it's it's a good point to make also, yes, for most parts of the bird genomes, we think actually not so much is going on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some examples. The first thing really being, we assume that roughly 70% of all bird species have more or less the same number of chromosomes. So that would be 40 pairs of chromosomes. So that's usually like a handful, two handfuls of macro chromosomes, so rather big chromosomes, so to say, then a few dozens of smaller chromosomes and tiny chromosomes sometimes. So we call those micro chromosomes and then Z and W sex chromosomes. So that's more or less kind of the standard for most bird species. And this was further confirmed also when then the first bird, bird genomes were sequenced and for example, chicken and zebra finch were compared to each other. Most of the chromosomes are highly syntonic and also collinear. So there's very few fusions and fissions between chromosomes, but also very few in rearrangements within those things. So all these things together really give us to the situation where we wonder like, what, is, what else is going on in these genomes? If, Let's say 95% of those genomes are evolving like this. What's going on in the remaining 5% of the genomes? And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So the idea being, well, there's three stories I'm going to tell you about so-called genomic oddities for the lack of a better name or term for this. The first story will be about transposons and W chromosomes. So that would be basically how these specific selfish elements can contribute to degeneration of chromosomes basically over time. And the second part of my talk will be about basically uh, how specific other repetitive elements, so-called satellite repeats, can be used to identify centromere shifts. So something that looks like this as a chromosome will maybe look now like this. 
And the last part I'm going to talk about is something that we can sum up as so-called genome or germline soma genome differences. And so some DNA that's present in some parts of the genome or parts of the organism basically, but absent in other parts of the organism. And before I want to talk about these results in particular, I need to get us all on the same page because what I'm going to talk about is basically non-model organisms. And so for non-model organisms, or actually most of the organisms that we can study these days, we can't just sequence so-called whole genomes. That means we would sequence from this end of the chromosome to this end of the chromosome in a single read, or from this end of the chromosome in this end of the chromosome in a single read. Right? This would, I guess, make our lives much easier. We would just very easily be able to compare different genomes this way. But what we do instead is actually something rather complex and tricky. And I'm going to use a silly metaphor for that maybe to remind of what's going on in here, basically. And the idea being, let's take a two-dimensional metaphor for something very complex. So this would be the Milky Way. So again, it's not very comparable to a genome, but the point being, we take something very complex, we don't know exactly how it looks like, and then we chop it into tiny pieces and put these things together afterwards. So we get something that we can connect sometimes, we put these all together, we know this one is next to this one, we call these things so-called contigues or contiguous sequence. Everything is known. All the base pairs from one end to another is known. And sometimes we know that this contigue is right next to this one, for example. We roughly know how far away they are from each other. And then we call them scaffolds. So that's kind of nice. All these things taken together give us some positional or relative information. But what we're often left with, and that even applies to many model organisms, is gaps. A lot of gaps, sometimes very long gaps. We don't know how big they are, smaller gaps. And so in the end, anything we do in genomics these days, for most organisms at least, will be something where we have fragments of sequences, longer ones and shorter ones. And we need to really keep in mind of what we cannot or might not see in our data because of these sequence properties in there. This is a very complex thing that we're studying here. And to kind of further extend the silly metaphor, basically, the point being, of course, if we have a puzzle game that has a lot of very small pieces, it's a bit more complicated and maybe more ambiguous in many regions than if you have bigger puzzle pieces, such as with recent long read sequencing technologies, basically. So this, of course, makes the whole thing maybe a bit easier. On the other hand side, another thing to keep in mind here is that, of course, the genomes are not just a puzzle game with a lot of pieces that look like this here that are complex to begin with, but they are a bit more difficult from the perspective that they're repetitive. And so another metaphor I want to just kind of have as a reminder here for the rest of this talk is that Genomes are not just strings of DNA where we have these protein coding sequences and introns and exons, but we have a lot of more things in there that we need to understand. And so in a nutshell, this would be a microcosm, so to say, of different repetitive elements in here. So just kind of to introduce some basic terms here, these can be interspersed repeats. So the same sequence in different places in the genome, basically. Um, that is usually because it has some capacity to move around or copy around. So this could be retrotransposons, for example, or retroviruses or DNA transposons, so they all have different means of moving around or copying around. And on the other hand side, we can have so-called tandem repeats. So we have the same sequence repeated over and over again next to each other as a long array, so to say, that applies to some genes, for example. This could be ribosomal RNA genes or immune genes. It could be satellites, which I'm going to talk about later in this talk, for example, in centromeres. And it could also be microsatellites, so for example, in telomeres. So please, please keep all these different aspects in mind when we think about genomes. This is a lot of complexity there that we maybe want to understand, or at least when we want to exclude them, we should know what we're excluding actually from analysis. And with that, I think it's time to jump into the actual data. So the first story I'm going to tell you about is about birds of paradise. And I think you find enough other videos on YouTube to explain why it's interesting to study these birds. I'm not going to do that for you now. Just look at these crazy colors and shapes and yeah movements that these birds make. But in a nutshell, basically, what we're trying to understand is really the genetic basis of what's happening in these crazy birds. And one particularly interesting part of the genome, of course, would then be the sex chromosomes. So this first part of the talk will be about transposons and, in particular, the W chromosome, the female-specific sex chromosome. And in a nutshell, just to get us again on the same page, there's a certain model of sex chromosome differentiation that we have to assume here as a baseline for what's going on. And we had beautiful talks by Katie Peichel and also Doris Bachrock in the seminar series a few weeks ago on X and Y systems. So I here want to just remind us the more or less equivalent situation in Z and W, just the sex being the opposite situation here. So we have something that's ancestral or proto ZW chromosomes that are recombining across the full length. They have a sex determining locus that, differenti that differentiates them. And if this is then linked together with a sexually antagonistic locus, we have a definition as sex chromosome, or in this case, 
W chromosome if it's female specific. And then over time, this might lead to the further recombination suppression across the length of this W chromosome and stepwise repeat accumulation over time. So all these repetitive elements I mentioned on the previous slides. So we're left with a situation nowadays in most birds where it looks like this. We have a more or less normal looking Z chromosome. Normal meaning it looks like an autosome to some extent. It's recombining only in males. And in females, we have a largely non-recombining chromosome that's usually enriched in repetitive elements and it's female specific by definition. So with that in mind, the first thing, of course, that you notice here, there's a lot of repeats in here that we expect. So of course, we need to make the best genome possible with the existing technologies to really be able to study those repetitive elements for the puzzle metaphor that I mentioned earlier in this talk, basically. So in a nutshell, what we did, or what Valentina Piona did, my PhD student who's been leading this project, and I highly recommend having a look at the bioarchive preprint here, where she also looked at lots of different technologies and how they assemble and not assemble certain parts of the genome. What we did together basically here was to really study one specific bird of paradise. It turns out not to look very uh, pretty compared to other birds of paradise. But the point being, we tried to combine all the different technologies we could get our hands on, such as long reads, Chicago maps, correct these with short reads, use linked reads for scaffolding, and for example, also high C maps for a chromosome level assembly. So long story short, all these things taken together, we can kind of minimize the biases of each technology and then combine the strengths of these technologies. So you can read more in this paper here, but the point being, this allows us to get a genome assembly that we think is somewhat comparable to the latest chicken genome assembly. And of course, then the first thing we should and could do is to, um, to compare this assembly to the chicken genome assembly. So that's what I'm gonna show you on this slide here. But before I do that, I'm just wanna introduce a so-called dot plot, which is basically where we compare the homology between one sequence and another. And we put a dot for every place where they share homology. So if something is entirely collinear, and no rearrangements and nothing repetitive, everything will just follow this diagonal line. So that's how it looks like in theory. So let's have a look at how this looks empirically, for example, by looking at the Z chromosome. It looks, of course, a bit more messy. Here we have the Z chromosome for the bird of paradise and the Z chromosome from the chicken. And as you can see, there's this kind of background noise, which are like short homologies in both orientations between all these different repetitive elements. That's expected. But as you can see as well, we have a bunch of regions or across most of the length some regions that are kind of the same orientation after each other. Um, so these would be blocks of synteny and also collinearity, maybe some less collinearity in this region here. But overall, we can say most of this sex chromosome, Z chromosome is more or less homologous between these two species. So how does it look like in the W chromosome? And I know I'm giving this away already with this title, there's low collinearity, but let's just have a look at the data, how it looks like. This is how it looks like. So it's, uh, I guess, rather messy, as you can see here. There's a lot of different, like very cloudy backgrounds here. Valentina nicely calls this the sea of repeats, basically. So these chromosomes here, bird of paradise against chicken, even though they're different in size, there's hardly anything really shared apart from the repetitive elements that are sitting in different places. But if you, if you trust me that if you spend now 20 minutes of staring at the slide, you would actually see some very short regions of collinearity between these two chromosomes. So that's where we know that the shared genes, the few genes that are remaining on the sex chromosome since the ancestor of proto-sex chromosomes are sitting on these chromosomes. But everything else is really just kind of bombarded with different repetitive elements leading to this sea of repeats. And it's not just any repeat. So I, the emphasis I want to make in this part of my talk is that if we look at specific types of repeats and we know how these evolve and how they move around, then we can sometimes also infer what those consequences might be. So the point being, in this case, it turns out that on these W chromosomes, we have a lot of endogenous retroviruses being present. And these come in two different flavors, which I need to briefly introduce here. When they jump into a new place, they're sitting somewhere as a so-called full length element. This is basically co containing two repeats in a repeat, and then the protein coding sequences that make virus particles and make the whole jumping possible in the first place. But after some time, they usually end up recombining with themselves stochastically during meiosis so that most of the um, LTR elements or endogenous retroviruses we see in bird genomes, but for example, also in mammalian genomes, they usually look like a so-called solo LTR. So these are not able to jump anymore. It's just a kind of like a small footprint of what's going on there. So let's have a look at how many of these full length elements are on the different chromosomes. I ordered them here by recombination rate. These the small chromosomes, larger chromosomes, and the Z chromosome. And as you can see, there's a huge peak of over 700 full length elements on the W chromosome. So we think these are potentially capable of still jumping around and doing things 
to the rest of the genome, basically, and the physiology of the host. And just to put this in concrete numbers, over half of all the retroviruses of the entire genome are sitting just on this one chromosome, at least based on what we have assembled so far. And keep in mind, this, this chromosome itself, what we have assembled, the W, makes up only 2% of the entire assembly. So we have a high enrichment, not just of these specific repeats, but those that we think are able to jump around and have consequences. Why am I making such a fuss about it? Well, if you remember Doris Bachfors' lab uh, talk from a couple of weeks ago and a beautiful paper that came out basically on the same day in Nature, Ecology and Evolution, um, she has this hypothesis that Y chromosomes, the non-recombining male chromosome in flies, is basically having a toxic effect, not because it has no genes on there or fewer genes, but on the other hand side, because it has specific repeats accumulated on there. And I'm showing this one here from comparison because Unfortunately, we're not able to do those kind of experiments in birds for sake of time and feasibility, but this is a, it's a nice thing to keep in mind, like how one would in theory be able to test this. So here, in this case, Doris's group basically made X0 experimental males, XXY experimental females, and XYY experimental males. So the point being, these are different sexes, each of them with different dosages of Y chromosomes. And when they then did aging assays, they found out that if you have two Y chromosomes, you live the shortest, you have intermediate age, basically, when you have just one Y chromosome, and you live actually the longest if you have no Y chromosome at all here. And so our hypothesis here would be maybe a similar thing is going on in the W chromosomes of birds, and then particularly linked to this jumping of uh, these retroviruses that are just so accumulated on this specific chromosome. And we're trying now to find different ways of really testing this and quantifying this over time without, as I said before, having this opportunity to test actually thousands of experimental birds. It's just not feasible at this point, unfortunately. So with that, I want to conclude this part of my talk. And I hope I could convince you that just by comparison of bird and like bird of paradise and chicken W chromosomes, we can already identify one chromosome that's very rapidly evolving, almost no collinearity between these two chromosomes. Instead, we have a lot of full-length endogenous retroviruses sitting on this chromosome, or these are also, I guess, contributing to this difference in, in the content of these chromosomes. And now to put a speculative explanation here, I'm putting this in red for that reason also, what does this mean? Could it, for example, mean that similar to the, the hypothesis by Doris Bachtor's group on the Y chromosome being toxic, maybe a similar thing is happening on the W chromosome. So maybe we have a female biased mutational load, for example, doing aging, during um, gametogenesis, for example, and then all the downstream consequences we can think of. But that's, of course, still speculation at this point from our side here. And with that, I want to now focus on the next part of my talk. So we kind of zoom out a bit. We still have birds of paradise in focus here, but we have a bunch of other birds. Some of them you might have seen today when you looked out of the window earlier this day. Maybe this one if you live, live in Europe, for example, or this one, or this one. But the point being, these are a bunch of different songbirds now that we analyzed for the presence of satellites and using these as a marker for centromere shifts. And I think I just need to briefly re remind you that this is a so-called acrocentric chromosome. So the centromere is here, and this is a so-called metacentric chromosome. So the centromere is somewhat in the middle, plus minus of the chromosome. And I think we all are quite familiar with the term centromere, and that is a very important feature of chromosomes. And we learned this already, I think, early in our biology education. But one thing we don't learn usually is that centromeres are actually among the most difficult things to study in genomes. And that's because they're, as the title says here, they're often unassemblable. So this will be an example from our own human genome. This is the X chromosome. Here on the X is a model for approximately one megabasis of just the same repeat, repeated over and over and over and over and over again because it's a satellite repeat array. So this makes them very difficult to study. And really, to emphasize this more, it's been only two years ago, less than two years ago, that the first human centromere was actually sequenced and assembled. So it's been that recent that we actually know the sequence of one single centromere. That's the Y chromosome centromere, which happens to be the shortest one. It's just 400 kilobases long. It's still super complex to assemble, but these authors here, Mitin Jain and Karmiga's groups, basically were able to span this by back cloning and then long read sequencing across these. But the point being, this is still not really feasible for non-model systems. If that is difficult for humans, you can imagine how much more difficult it might be in other systems where we don't have endless amounts of uh, cells available, for example. But one thing that we learned in this case is maybe what we can already use the existing technologies to not assemble those, play, those regions, but at least identify where they are in the assemblies. So this is research I started a couple of years ago together with Matthias Weissensteiner, who was then a PhD student with Jochen Wolf. And we looked together at a lot of different 
crow assemblies, genome assemblies. And we noted that some regions of these assemblies always ended up breaking down in the same repetitive element. So here's I'm, what I'm showing a PacBio scaffold or Contig, I think in this case, last 100 kilobases. And on this axis here, we see a repeat that we call CrowSat, which is basically a satellite repeat that we always find at the edges of so, such repeats here. So you see, this is somewhat a kind of a palindrome and a tandem repeat array of this specific strange satellite repeat just at the very end. And then this whole assembly basically breaks down. And when we looked at different technology, we actually noticed that this really fits with what I showed you before with these puzzle pieces, the sizes of the puzzle pieces here. Because the point is, if we now compare a short read assembly, Illumina, for example, it breaks down after a single copy of the satellite. And with the long reads, it breaks down after an array of roughly 20 KB, which really corresponds to the read length. But the point being, these things together, we can already use to identify those repeats. And uh, we were able to also then further verify this with a different technology, so-called optical mapping, that allows us not to sequence the DNA itself, but to kind of visualize specific um, sequences of, in, of spaces, basically, or motifs in the sequence DNA, basically, to understand um, how the molecules look like. So in this case, for example, we have a unique sequence here that maps to these assembled parts of the genome. And from here on, it kind of has this very repetitive pattern that very nicely match matches up to what is assembled as a CROSAT repeat here. So we think this goes on for hundreds and hundreds of kilobases and would therefore be um, a megabase scale satellite repeat array. So just placing this on different chromosomes, here's one example for how this would line up. Here we now have the green bars being scaffolds from a short read assembly. We have three between scaffold gaps, one, two, three. And then here we have the optical maps. And this allows us to identify based on repeats and these optical maps that this gap here is actually a special gap because it's at least one megabase in size. So this would be something where we can say this unsequable, unsequenceable or unassemblable sequence is basically in this specific gap. That's where it's sitting. And it turns out that this is spot on in the middle of the main FST peak between the European hooded crows and carrion crows. So this is quite an interesting genomic feature to keep in mind here. Um, and it turns out also to sit right in the middle of a recombination valley that's roughly two megabases in size. So here we have basically the uh, population scale recombination rate rho as a measure for that basically. So these things together kind of let us assume that this is a candidate region for a centromere. And uh, we can then, of course, try to allocate these in other genome assemblies. So this is what we've been doing since then. And this is work that's been led by Ivar Westerberg, who's a master student in my group. And Valentina is helping out with a lot of different repeat predictions in this case. And we were basically able to now compare a lot of different genomes where we have chromosome level information. And just now showing this one example of this one place that we could um, show on the previous slide, like the special gap, so to say, this region is basically present in crow. And if we align this, the flanks of this region to all the other bird species, it turns out this is absent there. So in crow, this is an insertion of this repeat array relative to the other species here. And this actually would nicely fit to what is known from centromere positions of zebra finch and chicken here, where it has been shown previously that these are in fact acrocentric. So the centromere is sitting at the very left end of it in the alignments here. So if we use our different methods that I presented now together and infer where likely the centromere might be sitting, turns out all the species here have an acrocentric state except for the crow, where then it seems to be plus minus metacentric and that would then correspond to a centromere shift in the lineage somewhere here, since it's common ancestor with birds of paradise. And while we were looking at this, it turned out actually the same situation we find also in the flycatcher here. So it turns out this one is as well metacentric um, but it is because it's because of a different centromere being in a different position here. So convergently kind of ending up with a similar situation. And I'm gonna use this one slide here now to kind of visualize that maybe what we think of the consequences of such a centromere shift once this happens, because this is maybe something that's a single insertion relative to the ancestral state, but it might have actually quite big consequences. So here we have the acrocentric ancestral situation, the house sparrow, for example, being one of those cases that has it. We think the centromere is sitting here. This is pedigree-based rec recombination rate, and we see smallest freely recombining across the rest of the chromosome. We think then that in crows, basically, there's been a cent centromere shift to somewhat the middle, middle-ish, basically. So here we have recombination rate plotted, as I showed before. And in this red position here, that's where we think the centromere is sitting now. That would be a relative position here in the other species. And in the flycatcher, we think now 
we have a similar value of recombination, which is actually partially overlapping with the one in Crow, but the centromere itself is not homologous because it's sitting in a different place. It's sitting down here. So these would be different positions now mapped or superimposed on these different species. So these, these different aspects taken together, let us assume that basically here we have a situation where the recombination landscape in these two lineages looks more or less the same, but the genetic basis behind that, the centromere, potential centromere position basically is actually convergent. And one thing that makes this thing even more striking is actually when we align these two chromosomes. So I'm just showing here, there's one example, the crow against the flycatcher and each line like delimitating collinearity between these two. And as you can see, they're almost entirely collinear. There's no other rearrangements that we can use to explain this uh, convergent drop in recombination rate. So this is what we think is actually maybe a way to then infer those larger changes across these species. So with that, I would like to conclude this part of my talk and I hope I could convince you also here, we're not there, we're nowhere close to being able to assemble those uh, centromeres in birds or any birds basically. But what we can do instead is use different methods such as satellite repeat prediction and optical maps to identify specific gaps that seem to be special and maybe are those candidate positions for where the centromeres are collapsed into. And when we do so and compare this in a comparative genomics fashion, like the flanks of these regions, we can then find out when, whether or not some of these things are actually centromere shifts. And in this case, then hinting at that this would lead to megabase scale changes and recombination rate. And for example, also genetic diversity and effective population size of those regions. So my speculation at this point would be, well, maybe these things are actually rather frequent. Now we're only able to actually um, find out how often this happens. So we're, we're about to kind of count this across different chromosomes, but the point being, this would be a way to have large changes in recombination rate, genetic diversity, et cetera, in the absence of any other rearrangements, fusions, in, inversions, et cetera, that are supposed to not be very common in birds anyway. So maybe this is something that's going on instead, basically. And with this, I want to move on to the last part of my talk, which is going to be a bit longer story because I need to kind of tell you a bit more background also a bit some of the weird things going on with this. Um, I don't think I have to introduce much this little bird here. I think some of you might have this one as a pet or you have worked on it or read about it because it's a very important model for vocal learning in birds, the zebra finch. But I'm going to sh show you some strange results about germline soma genome differences. So where part of the DNA goes poof during development. And this is actually something that's maybe not so um, new if you look or if you're familiar with the cytogenetic literature. So this is an overview here where all the different groups where we have germline soma genome differences are highlighted in red. So this is all across the tree of animals, for example. We also find this in ciliates here. And you see the oldest uh, date to this being described was actually in the, in the late 1900s, basically. And so the interesting thing really being this is something that has been uh, suggested for a while, but rather understudied, except for a few systems where there's been fantastic work by colleagues who have done that. And just as a reminder, our own bodies also have a so-called germline soma difference, basically, or genome difference. I want to just highlight this here. This might be one of the more simpler cases, basically, where our own blood cells, basically red blood cells, have no nucleus. But this is not what I'm going to talk about. It's not that simple. What I'm going to talk about today, basically, is something that's rather complicated in the mechanism we still don't understand the mechanisms behind that, but also what it does to the genome. And this is then something that's called programmed DNA elimination. The point being, somehow during germline soma differentiation, so germline being the kind of immortal cell lines that give rise to the next generation, and soma being the mortal body cells that are mortal at some point and yeah, don't stick around for long. During this differentiation, there's a program step where predictably specific parts of the genome are removed. So for example, in this case, you have a set of chromosomes in your germline, you get this from your parents, but then in the soma, they look different. So they might be smaller or acrocentric instead of metacentric, et cetera, different numbers even. So this is something where short genome fragments are removed during this whole transition. And it's quite well studied in ciliates especially, but also in some nematodes and in lampreys. So there's fantastic work out there. And I will highlight this in a Twitter thread later today, some of the key works there that I find super fascinating. Uh, but what I'm gonna talk about today is actually a slightly different situation of programmed DNA elimination, which is what we have in birds and some other organisms. So we have a set of chromosomes like this here in the germline. We have the same chromosomes in the soma, except for one or two or a few chromosomes that are poof gone suddenly. And these are by definition then so-called germline restricted chromosomes or GRCs. And this is something that's been known, for example, from hagfishes, from some dipteran insects basically, 
hand from the zebra finch. And you might wonder, well, why have I not heard about this? This is strange. Uh, maybe birds like this is was this was found yesterday. We did not find this. This was actually known for quite some time now. So if we look at the number of uh, the year of publication of this paper that found this work, this is 22 years ago. This has been actually known for quite some time. So people were studying back then beautifully the karyotypes of male and female zebra finches and also uh, the uh, male and female meiosis, and they found the typical chromosomes in somatic cells. Right? You see the you know the eight biggest chromosome pairs. The only difference being Z and W. So that's all as expected. All beautiful. And then they looked at germline cells from the same individual, in this case, the same male as here. They found the same set of chromosomes as in the somatic cell, all beautiful. But there's this massive lonely extra chromosome basically that, that does never exist in the somatic cells. And we know because there's a very nice somatic genome assembly published 10 years ago that sequenced all these other chromosomes or most of the other chromosomes. We know that this chromosome is 150 megabases in size. And this one here, the GRC, is bigger than this. So we think it's something like 160 megabases or 15% of the genome in size, which is rather surprising, I guess. So all these things taken together, when we started this project almost four years ago, there was hardly anything known about this chromosome from a genetic perspective. But from a cytogenetic perspective, because it's such a massive chromosome, uh, these authors here and colleagues, they were able to actually trace it nicely across gametogenesis. So what we knew back then when we started our project was something like this. Basically, we have it in male germlines, but somehow during male spermatogenesis, this germline chromosome is thrown out. So sperm don't have it. In females, you have it as one chromosome, like any other normal haploid chromosome, basically, in the oocyte. So that's all fine, like normal meiosis. Then we have this big black box here of what's happening in the early embryogenesis that's completely unknown even to this day, basically. And then we get to the situation in adults where we'd never have it in somatic cells one copy in male germline cells, never in female somatic cells, but two copies in female germ cells. So this is a very fascinating situation that we started with. But there was another study or another point that was done at that point, which was actually the same study I mentioned on the previous slide, was doing very painstaking work on sequencing 18 kilobases of this chromosome. It doesn't sound like much if we consider it's 160 megabases in size, but it turns out, I mean, this was 2009. This was before the next-gen sequencing revolution. So this was very painstaking and impressive work that the authors did back then. And it turned out what they sequenced here is clearly germline chromosome linked, GRC linked, but it is very similar to a regular chromosome. So these shared chromosomes, I will refer to from now on as the A chromosome, like the letter A, or regular chromosomes. So the assumption here would be that somehow the GRC or this region that was sequenced is somewhat homologous, like an aneuploidy or like a trisomy of this chromosome. And another thing that the authors noted, which is quite striking, is that when we then take this 18 kilobases of probe, it does actually hybridize to the regular chromosomes, two spots here, because that's a diploid situation. So you have two dots on each, as you would expect for a normal single copy locus in a diploid organism. So that's all as fine and I guess predicted because the homology is between is very high between these different regions. But when they then use the same probe, this 27L4 probe, on um, cells from the germline of the same birds, they found this situation. It's slightly different staining here and red now with cohesine, but the main point being this is a bit more than four dots, as you can see here, right? These four green dots. So what it looks like is something that used to be a single copy on regular chromosomes, so two copies now when you are diploid, was copied over to this extra chromosome and then increasing a copy number to something that's a couple dozen. I mean, we have been trying to kind of count the number of dots here, but we don't know for sure how many those would be. But that would be the situation we left. And if you keep this in mind for what I showed you before with this puzzle metaphor, these things taken together, of course, are nothing that seems to be easy to assemble or easy to study to begin with. So we took this into account, and we were rather lucky actually that our sequencing center back then when we started this was just doing a test run on something that's called 10x genomics chromium. And then before I introduce this technology, I need to um, mention two very important people here, Cormac Kinsella, who's the was my first master student in my group and who very bravely took on this uh, rather crazy idea when we first started it. We had no idea if this would work out at all. And then Francesco Ruiz Rano, who was basically back then a collaborator of the group and is now postdoc in the lab, basically. So I'm very grateful for these two guys who helped out a lot with this work because this was a very, very unpredictable endeavor. But what we did in a nutshell was to sequence a liver sample, so somatic DNA, a testy sample, germline DNA, and then these two things were sequenced and assembled separately so that we get two genome assemblies for the same bird. 
in a nutshell, what happens here is that with this Chromium approach, we have a barcoded primer library and we're able to then in a microfluidics device to separate single, single input molecule basically in a separate droplet so that afterwards when we sequence them with short reads, we know actually which reads come from the same input DNA molecule. And that's why these things are called linked reads basically. And this is quite important because it really allows us to reconstruct haplotypes of different chromosomes that might exist in the sample and might otherwise be difficult to assemble. So in a nutshell, what we did was basically in a genomics approach where we compared the different linked reads to an assembly by mapping, for example, but we also compared the different assemblies to each other. So here you see the reference genome that was published 10 years ago. So this would be the A chromosome a haploid version of that. We expect everything to be there in two haplotypes in the soma because that's just the two sets of chromosomes basically. These same chromosomes are present in the germline plus this extra haplotype, this extra chromosome basically, the GRC. I'm showing this little icon here now to help you with the next slides also where I'm talking about the GRC. And as you can see here, if we find regions that contain specific variants on this chromosome, so tissue specific variants, we can then use these as a marker to say this is a GRC linked region. And if this happens to be in a coding region, protein coding region, we can then also say this specific transcript, if we find this in RNA sequencing data, for example, with these variants here, this specific transcript is from this gene or more precisely from this power log on this chromosome. And in a similar way, we were then able to do this on proteomics data, uh, peptide mass spectrometry data, if where we're able to find specific variants that are basically amino acid changing. And if these are present in our peptides, we can then say this specific peptide is from this specific power log from this specific chromosome. So all these things together, I guess I'm already giving away we were able to do it, otherwise I wouldn't talk about it now. But the point being, this is, this is I think, a nice approach to really link ex expression of tissue-specific variants to the specific chromosome. But now I spent a lot of time earlier talking about uh, repetitive elements. So the first thing, of course, we were curious to see is like, are there any repetitive elements on this chromosome? Is it full of retroviruses like the W chromosome is? The title of the slide says no enrichment and repetitive elements. And trust me, we did a lot of different tests and yes, there is no enrichment. We even sequenced two additional birds with a different library prep to test if that's a technological artifact, but that's really not the case. So one way to measure this, for example, would be to plot the counts of uh, simple repeats or microsatellites in one tissue versus the other tissue here. And you see most things really follow this diagonal line. So it's no enrichment in one tissue versus the other. And in another way to visualize this would be a so-called repeat landscape. So here I'm showing you basically young repeats on this axis and old repeats and the relative proportions that they make up. And on this axis, I show you basically the subtraction of muscle. So the soma basically percentage of repeats from the testes, so the germline uh, percentage of repeats. The assumption would be if something is enriched on the germline chromosome, so in the testes, this whole plot should be in the positive values. There should be a peak up here, but everything is negative. So it turns out this chromosome is not enriched in repeats, it's actually impoverished in repeats, which is very, very strange and was not expected at all. So what's going on instead? What turns out to be going on instead is that we have actually an enrichment of genes which have become high copy number. So what I'm plotting here now is all the regular chromosomes, all the A chromosomes from the reference genome that was published 10 years ago. And on this axis, I'm plotting the ratio between coverage from one tissue and the other. And you would assume, of course, if everything, like both tissues have the same genome, everything should have the same coverage, right? more or less across the chromosomes here. But what we see instead is these peaks, local peaks across different chromosomes, which suggests that the germline restricted chromosome, which is testy specific, has basically acquired regions that are highly homologous to the regular chromosomes. That's why we can map to them on this plot here. But at the same time, they really increased in copy number from single copy on regular chromosomes to many, many, many copies. And this name here maybe sounds familiar. I've shown you from the previous study 10 years ago, this was already verified as something that is in high copy number. So that very nicely fits with what we found here. And we then decided to pick this region here, which is the second highest peak. We think this one has six, uh, 300 copies on the GRC. We then uh, made a uh, cytogenetic probe for, for sense in situ hybridization probe from this region and did a fish to see if that is true, if we can really trace that. And here we see two nuclei from muscle cells. Each of them are stained blue because that's DAPI for DNA staining. And you see nothing is glowing because these two copies are not enough to really be visible on a fish this way. But here we see a germline cell, a testy cell from the same bird. And you see this local blob, which is made up from these 300 copies on, on the GRC that are really giving rise to the signal here. So we think really that's a nice way to also trace the presence of this chromosome now development. 
So all these things taken together, I talked a lot about genes now. So are these genes expressed? Yes, they are. And I want to now introduce you to another type of plot just to kind of show you that this is, this is not an artifact. If we plot now, for example, the somatic DNA reads, each of these lines here being a somatic DNA read against the reference genome here for this one gene, everything is gray. That's just what is expected if, if the reads are identical to the reference. Now we take a different tissue from the same bird. This would be testes now, the GRC as an icon here. Most of the reads are gray, as expected. They're identical from the regular chromosomes, but we have some reads that have multiple colors here, multiple mismatches, because these are the testes specific, the GRC specific variants. And we now look at uh, different individuals, in this case now ovary RNA sequencing data, for example, we find the same pattern again. We find reads that are identical. So these are the paralogs on the regular chromosomes. And we find those other reads here with the colors, which are basically the paralogs on the germline restricted chromosome. So we think this way we can really nicely trace expression of this chromosome in different tissues. And overall, what we find is a few handful or a couple dozens even in ovaries of genes being expressed. And in the protein mass spectrometry data, we find actually four genes being expressed on the testes and ovaries. So really the point being, this is, this is a chromosome that likely contains extra copies of genes that are actually, or some of them are actually expressed and not pseudogenes and potentially they're doing something. So much for that. So I guess, I guess now the whole story is already seeming a bit stranger than I said in the beginning. This is not a, not a chromosome packed with uh, repeats, but packed with genes instead. So then the next question one might answer, uh, ask yourself is like, well, so what are these genes doing? Is this a random set of genes? And this is maybe the most speculative slide. I'm just going to also wave my hands here just to make clear like this is not an exhaustive set of genes. This is 115 genes that we absolutely trust because we have multiple lines of evidence, but we have another 200-ish genes that we also trust, but we're looking for more lines of evidence to verify them. So really take this with a grain of salt, but those genes here, those 115 are highly enriched for female gonad development and some other developmental term here. So I'm not going to tell you now um, a story about what this might mean. I'm just basically going to say this is a non-random set of genes. So something might be going on with these genes and they might be doing something. I guess that makes sense also if we find them expressed on RNA and protein level. But the next thing we can then also test, of course, is is there any signatures of selection on these genes? So for 17 genes, we had enough single nucleotide variance difference, 50 variance difference, pairwise differences between the paralogs on the regular chromosome and the GRC, so that we were able to have the power to detect uh, signatures of selection in uh, non-synonymous versus sub synonymous substitution uh, ratio analyses. From these 17 genes, we find that nine of them are very likely under long-term purifying selection, and one is under positive selection. Again, also here, this is just a subset of genes, so I'm, I'm not going to tell you a story about what this might mean now. It's just really to make the point, this is this something is going on with this chromosome. It is under selection, or at least these specific genes are under selection. So I'm not going to tell you about the why this chromosome exists here now, but I want to instead now focus on when did this chromosome emerge and what does this mean from that perspective? Like, where can we actually look for it? Because if you see here now, we can actually find single nucleotide differences between the paralogs. We can actually now look at them in a phylogenetic perspective. We can make a phylogeny from these things, such as here, where we have now the GRC paralog down here from our zebra finch. And up here, we have the regular paralog on the regular chromosomes, the A chromosomes up here. And all the birds I show here in between are basically relatives of the zebra finch that are available, somatic genomes available in the public databases that we could use for this analysis. And similar to what one would do with a sex chromosome strata, where you take the different paralogs together and make a phylogeny, this would then hint, uh, hint at this being actually an old gene on this chromosome, right? Because you have the two paralogs here and here quite widely separated, phylogenetically separated from each other in this tree. So we would assume this should be something like the common ancestor of all these songbirds here. And I have to admit, this sounds super fa fascinating, but it's also something that's difficult to believe, right? I mean, how could this be under our noses, but nobody really saw that until then. So while we were writing up all these results and still like trying everything possible to test that this is not an artifact, it turned out um, that there was a preprint posted on BioArchive that very nicely showed a complementary approach and very nicely helped us like really trust our own data, which is a beautiful study that in the meantime was published in PNAS by Anna Torgasheva. So basically, these authors here did a fantastic job in looking at 14 different songbirds, very in-depth on a cytogenetic perspective, and they found a germline chromosome in every single bird they looked at. 
They're sometimes tiny chromosomes, sometimes massive chromosomes. But long story short, they always exist. When you look for them, you will find them. That's the main point here. And so I think this very nicely adds up to the point being this being a very widespread chromosome, very likely, maybe even in every single songbird species that we will look at in the future. But to kind of continue on the thought of these evolutionary strata, the other extreme that we find here is something like this. So this would be the same phylogeny, like the same taxon sampling and, and uh, topology as on the left side for these somatic birds here, basically. And here we have now the two different paralogs clustering together from the germline chromosome and the regular chromosomes. And this here is the sister subspecies. So if this is true, this would mean this is a subspecies specific, a very young, very recently added gene on this chromosome. So to put all these things together, what we see here is something that really like a bunch of different strata ranging from the early evolution of songbirds to something intermediate age, and then a lot of genes actually on a very recent time scale. So if these numbers are correct, this would actually be the fastest evolving uh, chromosome of the entire bird genome in terms of its gene content, et cetera, even faster than the W chromosomes. So this is, of course, requires further verification, but that's where we're at right now. And before I conclude this part of the talk and kind of wrap up to the bigger picture here, one thing I think I also didn't mention yet is, well, where are these genes coming from, right? So if, if you assume this maybe started up as something like an aneuploidy or a trisomy, like an extra chromosome, does this mean all these genes are from one extra chromosome? It's just an extra block, basically, like a trisomy. I'm giving this away here in my title. I say it's from all over the place, but let's really have a look at this. How does this look like? So this is how it looks like. We have a place sort of in the circus plot now for the GRC up here. And then each red line basically connects its paralog to where it's sitting on a regular chromosome. So we have almost every single macrochromosome, intermediate chromosome, many microchromosomes, and even the sex chromosomes having donated, so to say, genes onto this chromosome. So in a sense, we can say this is a sponge for paralogs of regular chromosomes. And how this works, we don't know yet. And I'm happy to speculate about this later on in the discussion. But this is, this is I think, a fascinating phenomenon to think about from that perspective. How can all these different genes be stuck on the same chromosome now and then also be removed, with this chromosome being removed during development? One last point I want to make is we think now we also have pinpointed when this chromosome really emerged, because one of the genes, the STRIN71, which I mentioned before, in a different context, in the mapping context, so it's expressed on the RNA level, um, this gene tree here contains all the true songbirds that I showed before, the ocenes basically, but we also have the sub ocenes here and the deepest branch of Passeri formis, the Acanticidida, basically from New Zealand. So you see this is basically branching as an outgroup to all these. And so if this were true, actually, it's not just half of all bird species that have it, but something close to two thirds of all bird species, all pastorines that should have this chromosome. So of course, that's something we want to understand and find out if that's really the case or not. But this is already kind of an in interesting indication here. So with that, it's time to wrap up this part of my talk. So I hope I could convince you that this is a repetitive chromosome, just different type of repetitive than we normally think of, like not just satellites or, or uh, transposons, but just high copy number developmental genes, genes that used to be single copy that are now high copy numbers. And they're from all over the place. And really this next point, which was I think most surprising for us, the fact that we actually have evidence for an ancient chromosome in songbirds, so it's likely present wherever you're gonna look at in the future, but also a very rapidly evolving gene content. So this is quite a fascinating kind of directions here. And with that, of course, I'm going to end with some speculation again in red letters. And my, I'm waving my hands again just to make clear this is, this is still, of course, being tested. We need to think about all these different options or explanations before we can really um, make sure that we understand what's going on here. But what if this plays a role not as a sponge for extra selfish elements, as we kind of initially expected, but instead it plays a role in germline determination or minimizes antagonistic pleiotropy, for example, or dosage compensation, or sex determination, or a lot of other things you can think of here. What if that's going on instead? So I guess, yeah, time will tell, but we're trying to now kind of delve into this using different approaches. And this is something I aim to do really for all the topics I showed you today. We wanna to go to the why. why. Why do these things do the things they do, basically? So focus for now is really like comparative genomics aspects. We can find homology and these evolutionary events in different species. But then we need to look at the population perspective to really have an idea, okay, what are the allele frequencies and selection signatures on all these different regions? Is this all just evolving neutrally or what's going on there? And once we have those candidate regions, for example, for key function of a, of a region of interest, we need to do, of course, developmental genomics and functional genomics to fully understand what this means actually in the end. So of course, the experimental validation is something I'm looking forward to once I'm 
physically able to move to the University of East Anglia, that we can really look into those aspects as well, basically. But I think all these things together are needed. And with this, I have some final thoughts, just some last cent, like 50 cents at the, as the last point here. The first thing being, if you have a cytogenetics background, I don't think anything of this talk was particularly surprising to you. Because I think everything I showed today, and it applies to a lot of things in genomics, many of these things have been known for decades, sometimes even 100 years in cytogenetics. So I think now is more important than ever to really take the cytogenetics knowledge and verification into account to really understand what we're doing here in genomics. And I guess on that last point being here, especially with the current public health crisis, I think uh, we need to understand all corners of uh, the genome, including satellites, endogenous retroviruses, et cetera, all these, all these things that lurk inside of genomes to really understand post-evolution or exclude them from playing a role because that's really what's needed now, more basic research in this direction. And with that, I have a lot of people to thank. So you see all these lists of people here that are involved in the, or were involved in the previous uh, projects, ongoing projects, and also upcoming projects that we're starting right now. But there's two people I wanna mention in particular, because I also showed the main players on the different slide with names and photos. First person to mention is Martin Ederstedt in Stockholm, who basically is the initiator of this, uh, of this um, Birds of Paradise project. And then Wolfgang Forstmeier at the Max Planck for Ornithology, basically who is the initiator or had the idea for the germline restricted chromosome project. I also wanna thank my group, I think they're a fantastic team of scientists as well as human beings. And especially now that we are in our 10th week of uh, voluntary lockdown, I think it really shows like we, we're doing this together and, and we are supporting each other. Another type of support, of course, is the, the funding here that I have to mention as well. And I wanna mention also my mentors, Lars Podzielowski, David Ray, Sidi Prashad, and Maria Samar for support over the last years. I think otherwise I wouldn't be here and talking to you right now about these results here. So thanks also to all of those. And as a very last point I want to make, I know I'm, I'm running almost over time now, but the last point I want to make, I want to thank everybody out there who is um, actively speaking out against bullying and academia, because I think these days it's more important than ever that we really take care of each other and also try to make uh, academia a more healthy and safer place, basically. And yeah, with that, I'm ready to take any questions. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Alex. <laughs> that was a really interesting and enlightening talk for sure. And um, <laughs> you introduced us all to the intriguing world of genomic oddities and their various forms and functions. Um, so while some questions are starting to come in from the audience, I thought I'd start off with a question which I have for you um, about the third part of your talk in the germline restricted chromosome. Um, so I was quite curious how you mentioned that um, this chromosome was impoverished in repeats, so like the transposons and the other elements that you were talking about earlier on in your talk. And I was wondering whether you thought um, there could be any protective mechanisms which are, are stopping them jumping onto this chromosome, or could it be more a result of the fact that it's rich in these high copy number genes that you were talking about, and so they kind of don't make space for them to come, up, come on, if that makes sense. That's that's a very good question. So I I would just first answer with my gut feeling, which is the latter explanation. So that basically the reason why we see less repeats is just purifying selection kind of going on because you have a very gene rich or gene dense chromosome here. So and anything that jumps in there or most things that jump in here might be selected against. But I would ultimately, of course, wait for population level data so we can really prove that basically from the perspective of looking at um, polymorphisms such as insertions of transposons to really see, okay, are they, are they jumping there at all or do they never get there for other reasons, epigenetic reasons, for example. Yeah. Great, <laughs> thank you. Um, so we have a question about um, whether you could elaborate more at, at which developmental stage you think the germline restricted chromosome elimination takes place? And related to this, um, do you have any ideas on what could be the mechanism of this elimination? Oh, that's, those are two very good questions. The, the first aspect of that really being when it's eliminated, I think that's that's why I showed this black box. That The black box was actually from the paper I cited here, but I, I think they, they chose this for a reason because we have absolutely no idea at this point when and how this is eliminated. The good thing is at this point, I mean, we have, we have this probe that I showed, this DPH6 probe that we can use for basically making a cell glow or a nucleus glow if it contains the germline chromosome. So we're preparing right now to get different embryo stages. It's all a bit delayed because of the current situation for various reasons, but the point being, I think we have the tools now to really find out that this, does this happen very early or is this rather late, like at the point when we can actually identify 
primordial germ cells. So that's really at the stage when, when the embryo has thousands, tens of thousands of cells actually. So is this late or early um, happening? But uh, what was the second part of the question? Um, the point of um, how it's eliminated. I think that that's another kind of mystery here. If we, if we judge it from how it's eliminated in male spermatogenesis, it looks like it just starts basically um, condensing, very strongly heterochromatinizing at the beginning of meiosis one. So maybe there's some kind of epigenetic signal that somehow marks this chromosome and then it gets condensed and then just gets actively expelled literally in a micronucleus from the cell. The alternative would be, I guess, some kind of non-disjunction or yeah, it's, it's a bit difficult at this point to really say how this would work, but I guess a couple of mechanisms we can think of that. But I guess, long story short, either of these explanations will still have to kind of uh, stand the test of time by knowing when and how this, uh, when, when this chromosome is not there anymore, because one way or another, we have to assume one elimination during development or multiple, even thousands maybe. So this really depends on when and how this is eliminated. Right, <laughs> that's interesting. There's still more uh, work to find out. Um, oh, lots of more work, yeah. 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 <laughs> so we have a question about the first part of your talk. Um, and it asks, what would be needed to test the W chromosome toxicity hypothesis in birds? And do you think this could be feasible? I would say within the next couple of years, maybe not to the extent of what Doris Bachter's group has beautifully shown in Drosophila. So neither sample size nor in terms of making transgenic birds. I, I mean, we, so the plan is to be, we're going to make some transgenic birds in the next years. That's what we want to do. Uh, how big the sample sizes will be will be another thing. And if we can actually get such like um, artificial like uh, WO lines or uh, uh, those kind of aspects basically here, maybe not WO, but uh, ZO lines, for example. But the other aspect being at this point, maybe we can already use it as a proxy um, the, the evidence for transcription and translation of different retroviruses if they have W specific variations. So we think kind of in an indirect way now we can already show how many of them are capable in theory of jumping around. And ideally, I guess, if there was some kind of pedigree data, for example, or some other like single cell sequencing one could do in the future, one could really test that. Is, is there actually more transpositioning happening in males versus females. But of course, the importance here is like, how do you really normalize that for, for sample sizes and tissue, tissue states, et cetera? Mm, yeah, sure, <laughs> that sounds interesting. Um, so we have a question um, which asks, so you mentioned the very short regions of collinearity shared sequence between the chicken and uh, the bird of paradise W chromosome. Um, mm. Question asks, do these contain sex determinant genes or something different? So as far as I can tell right now, um, there's not really much known of the W specific component of sex determination. So as far as I remember from the literature, and I'm, I'm no expert on this topic, but as far as I remember, the only like clue for sex determination in birds so far is the DMRT1 gene. So this gene is located on the Z chromosome. And I think experiments from around 10 years ago in chicken show that basically it's the dosage, the number of copies of the DMRT1 gene that determines whether a bird becomes a male or a female. That means if you have double dosage, so two copies of it, you become a male bird because that's ZZ. And if you just have one copy, just single Z, that would then make you a female. So, I mean, in a strict sense, one can say that then the female specific region or the female determining region on W would be the place where the DMRT1 used to be, but it's not anymore. But that's mm -hmm. more like semantics from that perspective. So I. To my knowledge, there's nothing really W specific at this point that we could have as a hint for sex determining or sexually antagonistic loci as well. But we were trying to look for that as well because yeah, it, it would be would be um, sad not to look for it basically. <laughs> Great. Um, so I think we're just finished with one final question for today. But um, if you get a chance to look back at some of the other questions on Slack, that would be much appreciated. Um, so the final question. Um, it's back related to the germline restricted chromosomes. And the question speculates and asks, um, if not transposable elements, um, do you have any ideas about what could be hiding in the dark matter, unknown regions of these germline restricted chromosomes? Very good question. Um, so I have a bit of speculation at this point. I think we're still missing large parts of this germline chromosome that we cannot explain otherwise, uh, like through copy number variation or so. Because maybe what's happening here in these linked read approaches is that we're actually susceptible to specific nucleotide biases in our sequencing. So we might be missing quite a bunch of high 
GC rich regions. So what if, for example, we're missing all the repeats or any, any kind of region that is actually highly GC rich, we might be still underestimating that. So we're trying to solve this actually by doing uh, ultra long read sequencing with uh, nanopore basically now to really fill those gaps and hopefully have a better idea of that. But at this point, I, I guess, yeah, that would be one speculation or, I mean, the other important thing to keep in mind here is it's a bit difficult to estimate our copy numbers for, for genes on the germline chromosome because not every single cell in, in the testes has the germline chromosome, right? As I said, it's going to mm. be removed during spermatogenesis, but also testes is not only germline cells, it contains some somatic cells as well in there. So it's a mix of different, different uh, states here or, or um, chromosome numbers, so to say, from that perspective. Fantastic. <laughs> that's really interesting. Thank you. So I think that's all we have time for, for today, but it is our great pleasure to thank Alex once again for a truly fascinating talk. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much. <laughs> and then um, our next talk will be from Dr. Jenny Reagan on the role of diets in sex differences and lifespan. Uh, so we hope that you can join us um, same time, separate same place on Wednesday this week. And in the meantime, check out our updates on Slack and our Twitter feed and spread the word about our seminars. Thanks for taking part. And until next time, stay safe and see you again soon. Goodbye.